Hello, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about The Idiot by Dostoevsky. I'd like to go through this great novel exploring the structure of the plot as well as many of the themes which um, recur throughout the text. So what's this book about? Well, in a nutshell, you could perhaps describe it like this. A pure and naive man's inability to cope in a worldly and corrupt society. And the novel's in four parts. Part one is all about the prince, who is the idiot of the title. His name's Prince Mishkin. And this femme fatale character, Nastasia Filipovna. The action uh, centres around those two. And uh, we begin by meeting the prince on the train from Switzerland to St. Petersburg. He's been there recovering from um, an illness most of his life. He's originally from Russia, but he's uh, been under the care of this doctor called Schneider, who is treating him for this undisclosed mental illness, which um, epilepsy seems to be a big part of it. On this train back to St. Petersburg, Mishkin meets two gentlemen, a guy called Rogoshin, who uh, is going to be very important in the plot later on. This guy is, is obsessed with this woman called Nastasia Filopna, and he also meets um, Lebedev, who is this kind of rather comic, pompous and pretentious guy. They think he's a very odd individual. He's uh, dressed in a very unusual way. He has hardly any possessions. He just has this knapsack. And he comes across as a bit of an idiot. Nevertheless, when Mishkin arrives at St. Petersburg, they send him on his way to General Apanchin's place. Mishkin wants to go back to St. Petersburg because he wants to meet uh, his only surviving relation, who's just a distant relative, this general's wife. Her name's Lizaveta Prokofievna. And Mishkin arrives at his residence and um, he seems to charm um, the general and uh, his wife just through his sheer naivety and uh, guilelessness. Um, and throughout the novel, Mishkin has that effect on people. He also provokes hostility, though. The general's assistant, this, this young guy called Ganya, very ambitious, rather greedy individual as well. He uh, takes a dislike to Mishkin and he wants to marry uh, Nastasia Filopfna, this uh, woman Rogoshin is obsessed with, remember the guy in the train. But he's not wanting to marry her for love, he just wants her money. Uh, and he has this photograph of her. And Mishkin sees this photograph and he's transfixed by her beauty. And uh, this doesn't leave him for the rest of the novel. He becomes deeply in love with this woman. And it starts with looking at her on this in this photograph. Uh, it turns out Nastasia Filopovna was taken in by this guardian figure, Totsky, who abused his trust and um, basically took her as his uh, mistress. And uh, she's grown up to despise him uh, for this, although she's uh, very wealthy. Indeed, any of the suitors, including Ganya, um, she treats with a great deal of disdain and ridicule. Now, Mishkin has got nowhere to stay, but he's given lodgings at Ganya's family residence. And they're quite poor, really, much to uh, Ganya's embarrassment. Um, he's a very pretentious guy and he, he wants to impress, but he's uh, he just feels shame about his family, particularly his dad, who is another general, General Evolgin, but he's a, an alcoholic and he just makes up these elaborate stories about himself. There's also this weird guy called Ferdyshenko who is a very kind of seedy, shadowy character who always asks people for money. He, he just gambles it away. He's always in debt. Now, Nastasia, who is considering marrying uh, Ganya, um, remember Ganya doesn't love her, he just wants her money, she unexpectedly turns up at Ganya's family house to meet the in-laws as such, the prospective in-laws. And uh, there's this great row that erupts. 
She is this real kind of brash, abrasive character. Ganya's sister despises her. Ganya's father completely humiliates himself. He kind of tries to impress her with this story, but she just humiliates him by uh, saying that he that she read the story in a newspaper and, um, and he has nothing to do with it. And it all gets a bit much for Ganya. And uh, he actually ends up hitting Mishkin in the face because Mishkin just seems to <laughs> really rile him, just really wind him up through his uh, naivety and his goodness. And it's, it, Ganya's very jealous of Mishkin as well because Ganya's always trying to impress and to move up the kind of greasy pole, as it were, but Mishkin seems to do all this effortlessly without any sense of ambition. And then the action turns to Nastasia's residence where she has a birthday party. And this is the climax of part one. The guests get drunk and they start sharing their deepest secrets. And here Nastasia asks Mishkin for advice about her proposed marriage to Ganya. And Mishkin just tells the truth. He says, look, he thinks it's a bad idea. And so she breaks off her engagement to Ganya, much to Ganya's despair. And then Rogoshin turns up with his entourage, these drunken guys. And remember, Rogoshin is the guy who Mishkin met on the, the, the train right at the beginning of the novel. And Rogoshin has inherited a vast sum of money. He's obsessed, he, he loves Nastasia and he just wants to buy a hand in marriage. And he has a hundred thousand rubles he gives her. But then unexpectedly, Mishkin reveals his hand and he says, you know, I'd like to marry you as well, Nastasia, and I'm due to inherit a sizable sum myself. So Nastasia suddenly has got these three men uh, who want to marry her. Ganya, Rogoshin, Mishkin, she's rejected Ganya. And then Nastasia appears to accept Mishkin's hand in marriage, but then she uh, changes her mind and she goes off with Rogoshin. And in a really theatrical way, she throws the 100,000 rubles into the fire, much to everyone's shock and horror. And uh, people can't bear to see this money uh, burning. And she, uh, because she hates Ganya so much, she kind of tries to humiliate him by getting him to pull it out himself. Um, eventually she takes the money out and the money isn't actually burned. Most of it's fine and she gives it to Ganya. It's a final act of spite and defiance. With part two, we dwell on Mishkin and his inheritance and some people who attempt to swindle him out of his inheritance. The action moves on a few months later and um, Mishkin moves to, to Moscow briefly to receive his inheritance but then he begins to write to the Apanchins again as well as Kolya who is um, Ganya's younger brother, who Mishkin gets on quite well with. Mishkin catches up with Rogoshin because Mishkin can't um, stop thinking about Nastasia. And um, it turns out that she's not been faithful to him, but he's been beating her up. And um, Rogoshin actually reveals that Nastasia loves Mishkin. It's here that Mishkin and Rogoshin cement some kind of brotherly bond between them despite how they are in many respects polar opposites Rogoshin who's just driven by his passions um, quite a dark character and the uh, incredibly pure uh, figure of Mishkin and they have this uh, discussion uh, about the Christian faith in, inspired by this picture on Rogotian's wall, a copy of Holbein's uh, Christ lying dead in his tomb. After this meditation on the Christian faith, Rogotian seems to give his blessing for Mishkin to pursue Nastasia. But Rogotian isn't as friendly as he seems and he um, attempts to murder Mishkin, attempts to stab him. But what saves Mishkin's life is that he has a fit 
and he kind of falls down the stairs, uh, thus saving his life. Mishkin then recuperates and he, um, he stays at Lebedev's uh, villa in Pavlovsk, just outside uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, it's here the Apanchins, particularly the mother and the three daughters come and uh, help Mishkin get back on his feet and uh, Aglaya um, reads him a poem, The Poor Knight, which she kind of identifies uh, with Mishkin. But Mishkin's kind of mocked as well by some of the other suitors to Aglaya's sisters, including a guy called Radomsky and um, Prince S. It's here that some young people turn up at Lebedjev's villa and they demand to be admitted and to see Mishkin. And uh, they claim that this guy, Berdovsky, is actually the rightful heir to this uh, fortune and that he's been swindled out of it by Mishkin. And there's this scandalous article in the newspaper written by Berdovsky's friend Keller to support this claim. One of the most vocal hecklers is this guy called Ippolit, who is actually dying of tuberculosis. And um, he's a nihilist. He's, uh, he's completely kind of lost faith in any sense of the divine and therefore he's completely disenchanted with with life and the pleasures of life and he kind of focuses his hate on Mishkin. Eventually these troublemakers are kicked out um, and Ganya, who's a lawyer, you know, says they've got they haven't got a leg to stand on basically. But then the Stasia turns up unexpectedly in a carriage just outside and claims that one of the Apanchin girls suitors, Radomsky, um, owes her a load of money. She's trying to um, scandalise him and uh, bring his name into the dirt. And this is all too much for Mishkin. He kind of collapses again. Mishkin is scolded by uh, Lizaveta Prokofievna, remember is distantly related to him, about his naivety. Part three focuses on the person of Ippolit uh, and his attempted suicide. Ippolit is very much a kind of shadowy uh, mirror image of Mishkin. Um, they're both very ill, but um, one is an angry, nihilistic young man um, and the other is an idealistic, pure figure. There's a lot in this part about the conflict between um, uh, Christianity, the Russian Orthodox faith, and various hues of atheism, um, liberalism and uh, socialism, etc. And these young troublemakers, uh, in, headed by Ippolit and Berdovsky, seem to um, encapsulate these ideals which threaten um, faith. But we find out that Ippolit and Berdovsky are actually repentant of their actions. Um, they uh, realise they're in the wrong and um, they kind of draw a bit closer to uh, Mishkin, even treat him with a degree of admiration. Nastasia turns up again in a park and creates an, uh, a whole new drama. And it's here that Mishkin finds out from Rogoshin that Aglaya the youngest of the three daughters, the Apanchin daughters, uh, loves him. Remember, she read that poem to him while he was recuperating. And Ganya loves her as well. Then it's Mishkin's birthday and all these people turn up for a party. But um, Ippolit um, starts giving his life story, really, and his, his last will and testament, he putting the world to rights, outline what he believes in or what he doesn't believe in and uh, he's feverish he's kind of going out of his mind and he threatens to shoot himself and people don't really believe him the other people mock him and they think he's just 
acting in an attention-seeking, ridiculous, rather narcissistic uh, way. But then he does actually try to shoot himself, but it fails, which kind of heaps more mockery on him, as well as a degree of shock in the house. Mishkin meets Aglaya in the park and it turns out Nastasia has been writing her letters about Mishkin. Mishkin, is, his heart's like tormented by Nastasia as well as Aglaya's uh, feelings towards him. And as a kind of subplot, Lebedjev has had 400 rubles stolen from him. And it seems that um, General Ivolgin uh, Ganya's father might be responsible for this. Nastasia meets Miskin unexpectedly at the end of this part. Part four, the denouement of this, this novel, is concerned with Nastasia's murder by the jealous and obsessive Rogoshin, and also Miskin's complete mental collapse resulting from this. It turns out that Mishkin is betrothed to Aglaya now and they have this important high profile social event at the Apanchins residence but Mishkin starts to rave, he starts to lose his mind, he goes into this kind of tirade against Catholicism and he, he collapses and, um, and then to heap further torment on him Aglaya and Nastasia have some kind of showdown over him and uh, he's forced to choose Nastasia over Aglaya despite the fact that he, he, he loves both women but he has a fear for Nastasia, particularly her face so it comes to the wedding day and he, Nastasia arrives at the church to marry Mishkin but just as she's about to enter the church Rogoshin turns up whisks her away on a train and then Mishkin the next day goes to try and find her. Eventually Mishkin tracks Rogoshin down and uh, Nastasia's murdered body is revealed to him. She's lying on a bed. She's been stabbed in the heart by Rogoshin. The two of them have this kind of vigil with the dead body. The police arrive in the morning and Mishkin suffers a complete mental and nervous breakdown and he's back in the care of Schneider. It seems things have gone full circle, if not even worse, for Mishkin since when we met him at the beginning of the book. So what are the themes in this novel? There's a lot about innocence and corruption. Mishkin epitomises kind of holy fool, if you like. It's one of those tropes common in Dostoevsky's works. A very pure, noble character, but a, a character open to ridicule and mock mockery. And he's surrounded by vain, ambitious, greedy uh, people driven by lusts and desire. And coupled with that, there's the the contrast between um, love and hate, um, the inability of sinful people to receive love. Um, Nastasia is a fascinating character because she's been mistreated herself throughout her life and she's certainly no angel, she's very unstable and when Mishkin offers her, her his heart, it's like she can't accept this goodness, she can't accept this love because she's so corrupted. It's very tragic, actually. There's the sense of Christianity and atheism at loggerheads. Mishkin, of course, being the Christ figure, and uh, Ippolit and perhaps Rogoshin, the, the opposites, if you like. And reflecting Dostoevsky's own uh, struggles, there's, there's plenty of gambling in this, this story, um, alcohol, um, mental illness, epilepsy, fits, um, and the execution passage where, he where Mishkin describes an execution, perhaps 
very much uh, an echo of Dostoevsky's mock execution, perhaps. And this painting, Holbein, uh, the body of the dead Christ in the tomb. Dostoevsky said, to paraphrase, uh, the, um, the mystery of Christianity um, challenged by the worst the world can throw at it. You know, and in this painting, Christ is just depicted lying flat on his back, uh, rotting, basically. That's in the book. It makes people lose their faith. Although, paradoxically, for Mishkin, perhaps it, it uh, strengthens and deepens his faith. There's plenty about obsession and shame and scandal. Like all great works of art, um, the whole of human life is in this. And it is an incredibly powerful, thought-provoking work. I mean, you don't need me to say that. It says so much about the darkness in the human heart writ large in society and how a, a truly good person can uh, be destroyed by it as Miskin is and I suppose you could argue Jesus Christ is as well uh, if, you, if you think of it go down that theological route I have to say I did find I do find Miskin a slightly a bit of an irritating character sometimes you just Sometimes just want him to kind of give him a slap round the face and tell him to kind of wake up and just smell the coffee. You know, he's just a bit a bit wet sometimes. I think um, I think that's probably my only criticism, if I may. But um, but yes, the Idiot by Dostoevsky definitely um, a great novel and um, check it out if you haven't read it or, or reread it if you haven't read it for a while, like I hadn't. And um, there's just a brief slideshow of uh, pretty much what I've just said, the, the, the synopsis of the plot and, um, and the themes just after this. Thanks for watching. Bye.